Well, thanks very much for joining us on the next episode of the iPhotography podcast. This is Stephen and Rebecca, and we're all going Sigmund Freud today. <laughs> if you don't know what we mean, this is kind of a chance for you to lie down on the couch and let us diagnose what type of photography suits your personality. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds all very, very, very bizarre, bizarre, but I promise you, it's something that I think is kind of quite interesting because I know when I started in photography, I ain't got a clue what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this. I want to do that. I want to do a bit of everything. Um, and I think after a while, your kind of personality finds certain areas of photography a little bit more interesting than others. Did you ever find that? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, I'm I'm not one to be lying down in a field of sheep. (laughs) I don't know what kind of personality would necessarily render that interesting, but... (laughs) I can go with it but yeah I mean either way it's it's, it's kind of the process of of breaking we're not going to get too much into the psychology of it somewhat but we thought it'd be kind of quite interesting for you listening that if you don't know where you want to be as a photographer and you maybe want to have a little bit more purpose maybe trying to kind of use your personality to guide you and basically find areas of photography that that suits you in a way that because we find certain areas of photography do appeal to certain types of personality. So we've reached out to all our tutors who, who specialize in different fields of photography to kind of get a better understanding as to what they find is, you know, they, they know is a successful trait or, you know, the traits that you necessarily need to be, you know, comfortable and potentially suitable uh, and successful in such a genre. So we've, we've got like five different areas of photography that we wanted to go through, didn't we, Rebecca? Yes, we have, yeah. And some of the genres are quite popular as well. So it's interesting to know why they're popular and what sort of traits you need to be within that genre. That's it. We've not gone too niche not to be like a, a chicken photographer. I think it's what we talked about on an episode a long while ago. You'll have to go and look back for that one. But yeah, so we, we've gone something a little bit widespread because, um, yeah, like you said, the, the, they're popular for a reason. So we'll kick off with the landscape photography. Um, obviously, you've got to be an outdoors type of person, but not just a person that's like, oh, it's sunny. I'll go out like today. It's like really sunny outside. I'm not just going to go out because it's sunny, but someone who is just has a passion for being in the outdoors you know having the fresh air maybe just like they love kind of going walking really as well because there's a lot of uh, like hiking and trekking involved in landscape photography isn't there yeah there is definitely Sorry, the ice cream man's just come <laughs> <laughs> well actually that's a weird step because that's next part is the ice cream photography <laughs> personality I the dogs would start barking <laughs> <laughs> if, if anyone's watching the youtube version of this podcast and they see some dogs dash up to a window in a minute it's because the ice cream man's arrived at rebecca's <laughs> um but yeah i i think um again we may repeat some of these types of uh kind of personality traits in in other areas but patience i think patience is one thing that you'll need to find a lot as a photographer in a whole wouldn't you you find it in so many different areas yeah definitely but i mean especially with landscape photography um I know a lot of the students say that they get up early um, Mm. because there's less people around. And if you're going to photograph a particular landmark or something that's kind of quite popular, um, people are something you'd have to contend with. Yeah. Um, So a bit of patience um, and an early start. (laughs) As much and I I love landscapes. I really do can appreciate a beautiful landscape, but I am not getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I just... (laughs) I'm more of a morning person than I am in the evening, but morning is half past six and onwards. Not four o'clock is, is just the it might as well be nighttime for me, really. But yeah, if we if we kind of encapsulate it a little bit, I suppose the five, maybe like yeah, I got four or five different personality types for a landscape photographer. I'd say, yeah, motivated to to want to get up and you know, not necessarily be kind of um, you know, scared of the cold so much. Um, meticulous as well, because I, I know from landscape photographers we've met that they they plan out things, don't they? To yeah. A massive degree so they know where they're going where the sun's gonna be the angles they want to photograph so very very you know small a small amount of it is left to chance and I think also you've got to be relaxed in that instance because if because you're at the mercy of the weather if if the weather just turns bad for one reason or clouds come over the sun because you can't predict for that you've just got to be kind of chilled out and not get wound up that you know things haven't happened for you really but I think that happens again across a lot of photography especially dog photography kind of looking at the dogs on screen now you've got to be chilled out because they're not going to do what you want them to do all the time do they oh god no I wish (laughs) 
know, and I, um, I think that... yeah, I definitely you've got to be relaxed as a landscape photographer because you you're going to have to be at one with nature um, for quite some time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I think that's well. That patience is the other thing I was going to say. That because again, maybe like wildlife photography, you've got to sit for a while and and wait, really, don't you? I mean, you can plan, yeah. you know, when the sun's going to come up, you know, when that's happening. But you want to be set up and ready, you know, a little bit in advance. And if a cloud comes across and and it spoils it, you may have to wait for a little bit. So, so yeah, I think yeah, you're right. Being comfortable with yourself and just you know talking to yourself or whatever it may be. Uh, is important really so I, I think those are uh, some really kind of important traits to have on but um should we look at wildlife photographers next yeah let's go go on I'll let you kick off with that then yeah so I think um a lot of the personality traits for a wildlife photographer is very similar to a landscape photographer and um, because you've got to again be patient and be outdoorsy um but I think wildlife photographers take that almost off a level um because with a landscape photographer, you can, you can plan and you can be meticulous and you can find a location and wait on the weather. Then you've also got an animal within that, so it's whether that animal's going to show. <laughs> well, that, yeah, you're so right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and it, again, you can be up early, sometimes late at night. You know, you have to follow the animal's pattern. They will uh, <laughs> learn to your sleeping pattern. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> that'd be lovely though if that happened, wouldn't it? You, know, you Would just you? woke up and then all the birds sat on your windowsill waiting for you. Just it's waiting. like, Please what was it? Photo. What's the film? It's a Disney film. Is it like a uh, Sleeping Beauty like or something Snow like White. that? Yes, yeah, Snow White, and all the animals just follow her. It's like, yeah, turn around with the camera. She would have made a killing out of Nat Geo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think in wildlife photography, you also have to really understand the subject. You know, every animal is different and they all have their own personalities as well. So you have to kind of understand their personalities to know, okay, the bird is going to come down from the feeder and then go back to the branch or come down to the feeder. So I'm going to get him when he goes back to the branch. Um, so it is a lot of watching and observing and waiting um, and being quiet, you know, so you couldn't go necessarily with a, a group of people and have a chat and a cup of tea whilst doing landscape, um, wildlife photography, whereas you could with landscape. So I think you have to be quite comfortable in your own skin as well and, and quite comfortable in the quiet, um, which is, is, is quite a, a tough thing because it can be hours and hours sat in a muddy ditch waiting for a fox to poke, poke his head out <laughs> um, and you may not still get that shot. So I think you have to be really kind of patient um, and really persistent uh, are the main ones um you've got to keep trying you know one one day the fox will show um <laughs> but it's a good payoff uh, I, come the end of it though isn't it you know when i think that feeling like with anything when you get you've been trying so long for one particular photograph and you get it that feeling it just completely makes everything worth it as you say if you've been sat in a muddy ditch for hours on end but you've got the one shot you're like that was worth it and everything else yeah. just fades away and that's the what time I just disappears yeah that's it that's what I love about photography because I, I can never be a wildlife photographer I have so much respect for for people that that follow that passion because yeah you're again the patience persistence the not being a fidgeter you know basically yeah. like you said being sat down for a long time not talking Quiet you know yeah, yeah and, and on your own pff, no it's maybe a, it's certainly something for an, an introvert person I think who's quite happy uh to to not be bothered by the outside world um I think I can see the appeal for it massively but yeah hats off to anybody that does it because I, I know you've and done you have a lot to of like it. animals oh yes of course <laughs> at some point you have to like the animals <laughs> Well, yeah, so I, I think you're, you're right. You, you hit them the note on the head to say you need an understanding of the animal as well. Um, you, the patterns, behavior patterns, you know, what they could do, what's iconic and, you know, worth photographing about them, really. So I think a bit of research potentially beforehand, if you've got like a, a bird spotter's guide or something like that, if you know what you're photographing and you've got a bit of in, information about them as well. Um, that's really important because, yeah, you're, you're sat for long periods, aren't you? And, and that can be really draining. Yeah, it can. And it, it can be really disappointing if you are sat for ages. You know, on one side of things, you may get that shot, but on the other side, you may not. And you may yeah. spend two, three, four days waiting for something. 
and it, it's a lot of time um, you put into, especially with wild animals. Um, if you're trying to get them to get used to you, uh, as with, you know, foxes and things, um, I know some people have trained them to come to their garden and things, but it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to really kind of put up with yeah the, the lows as well as the highs. Yeah. That's so well, that's it. Yeah, you're not. It's not maybe like landscapes again, dependent upon the lights, etc. But you go out and the landscape is there. Where, as you say, with mm-hmm. wildlife. You've got to wait for it to come to you. You may have to coerce them, set up bird feeders and things like that. So the, there is a bit of you know planning and and kind of um, you know a situation you've got to build wishing. yourself. Yeah, and wishing. Yeah, and just sometimes just praying is is the main thing really. So yeah, I think you're yeah, kind of patience, persistence, uh, a love for animals someone who's quite happy to sit on their own and it's kind of quite mentally strong that they can deal with disappointments. I think those are um, some really kind of really important personality traits from there. Um, Let's have a look down. What what else we got on our list? What was next up? Portraits. Now that's interesting because I think that's be kind of quite different for, you know, you and me both, we, we, we've shot portraits for years. So I think we can speak about this kind of quite honestly, um, because you never necessarily know how your shoot's going to work out depending upon your subject. And especially if it's young children, then you, mm-hmm. you've got, you've got no chance of knowing what the outcome's necessarily <laughs> going to be. It could be a dream or a nightmare, but you've got to be a people person. You, you've got to have, like we said, with wildlife, you've got to have an interest in, in animals, but Obviously, you've got to have an interest in people being a, uh, a portrait photographer, but it's not just an interest in people and their stories, but also, I think, how they they operate on a psychological level. Um, you know, how you can kind of things that you can say to them to help them make relaxed or how you direct them a little bit and how you can convey their personality through their pose. Um, it's quite it, it feels yeah. like manipulative in a way, but depending on the style of portrait you're going for, it's going to be really, but you can kind of create something from nothing by certain poses and lightings and expressions. So you, you've got to be comfortable manufacturing people, I think, to, to that degree, to, to direct them comfortably, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. And I think the way the camera sees things and the way people see themselves or people pose themselves is completely different. Oh, yeah. Um, and you've got to focus on what's on the back of the camera and how it's showing to the camera. And as you say, then direct people um, and sometimes push them a little bit to do what you want them to do. Um, even if it is a little bit out of their comfort zone or a bit uncomfortable or, you know, that if it's going to make a good picture, you have to be confident enough to express that across to them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's generally more for kind of pose portraits, which, you know, you and I kind of um, dabble in a lot, but in terms of candid situations as well you have to like to observe again um similar to the animals watch the people's behaviors and how their body language is and and to try and express that through the the camera um again is is a a talent on its own I think oh yeah it's it's and it's tricky um because again if you're working with young children say for example you never necessarily know when the expression is going to occur, how long it's going to be for, and necessarily in what direction they're running at the same time, because that's pretty much inevitable that they'll be moving because they never seem to stay still ever. But that's like a slightly separate thing to deal with. But yeah, it's it's predicting human nature. Um, so I, I think kind of, yeah, psychologically kind of understanding humans, uh, not to say that you have to go and, and have a degree for psychology to, to be a portrait <laughs> photographer, but I think just being empathetic um, yeah. being kind of, um, you know, understandable uh, of traits and personalities. And I think, you know, the more and more people that you meet, the more photo shoots that you do, you'll start to meet different types of personalities and you'll get a feel kind of for, for how people will relax because whether you're working with the general public or a professional model, they're going to behave totally differently um, in front of the camera. So some you'll need to give more direction to than others really. But yeah, on top of obviously knowing you know all that and kind of you know how to behave around people you've also then got to think about your normal lighting scenarios and your camera settings and and then also about how to flatter somebody as well because especially if it is a member of the general public who's really nervous about having their picture taken um you've got to know the best lighting the best angles um so it is kind of a multitasking job isn't it really you've got to spin is, many yeah. plates and as you say as, as well as knowing all your camera settings you then got to make them feel comfortable by being conversational and, yes. and kind of friendly and warm and 
and you know you're juggling a lot of plates at once so i would definitely say um that you have to be quite um a multitasker let's say yeah 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 you're right i think yeah whereas we were saying before like with um wildlife photography and maybe landscapes you know it could suit an introverted person because it's a bit of a solo event i think for portraits you've got to be a bit more extrovert um you've like you said you've got to be confident reassuring and precise and clear so it's like public speaking to some degree mm-hmm. um but yeah like a people person to be conversational but also like a people watcher who, who you like to kind of observe language uh, but then also adaptable i think to some degree because especially again you know if it's uh, if it's dogs or if it's children let's say you've got to change to to kind of you know basically what your subjects doing really so i think this it's totally different type of personality from the other ones before we've looked at um it's, it's kind of like the skills that you need or the traits that you need really so it, it's maybe uh for someone that's a little bit more outgoing you may find a find portraiture kind of a little bit more appealing potentially but um but what about weddings that's the next one that we've got on our list what what, what kind of personality suits a wedding photographer would you say that's tough because it is very similar to a portrait photographer um with 10 more plates <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you're right. yeah. That's so true <laughs> In many ways, the fact there's more people, there's more to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the likelihood is as a wedding photographer, you're also trying to run a business. So not only is your photography and your personality an issue, but you also need to consider how the outside world views you as a brand. Mm. Um, it's really tough and especially charging. Everyone will want something for free. You have to be strong willed, I think, as a wedding photographer. Um to be able to put your foot down and demand what is what is deserved. Yeah. Um, I also think a lot of attention to detail goes into wedding plannings because it is one day that this couple will remember for the rest of their lives. And, you know, you can't be the reason why things go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> God, that would so be mortifying, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you have, yeah, you have to plan to make sure that the bride and groom are happy at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a lot. And, you know, it's a, a long day for yourself as well. Yeah. So you will literally be battling with crowds. Uncle John who steps out in the way all the time. Always an Uncle John, <laughs> isn't always there? Always Uncle John. Always, yeah. And he's always the one that's got his camera. You know, he's bright. And he's, he's bought this lovely brand new, probably like an Odell. I just, I've got a picture on my head of know what Uncle John's look like as well. And you think, right, yeah, I've, I've, I've read the news manual. I know how to use it, right? I'm going to go and take all these photographs and stand right in front of the hired photographer. And yeah, I know, I'm sure Emily, if she was on this podcast, she would be screaming at those situations because I, I spoke to her about this in advance about kind of what kind of personalities you know what what traits she said that would be suitable and you and you're so right the the happy and energetic um aspect is really important because she just she's just the absolute kind of um Antip- antip- antipathis I think that's the word the epitome either way I need epitome, a different word. Yeah. the epitome <laughs> of kind of energy um and I, I think you do need that because you're right because what you could shoot them from like seven eight in the morning to what maybe like nine ten o'clock at night couldn't you yeah as and as any travel time on top of that as well and yeah it is a full day of shooting it's not bits and bobs throughout the day it's from the word go until yeah. the word stop so yeah. i think you have to have a good stamina to plow through with all of that um and be really organized as well you know you have to know where you're going be there on time um you have to be really organized in that that sense um I also think you have to know your camera like the back of your hand. Yeah. Because you're very quickly changing from close ups to long shots to different situations. And you have to be able to flick your settings like lightning speed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, I, I imagine they, I don't know. Um, uh, okay. I'm sure Emily would probably be able to say. But they probably would use like custom functions and maybe have a yeah. couple of custom functions kind of preset on their cameras to, as you said, literally go from A to B, you know, within the, the, the blink of an eye. Possible. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And you have to stay calm. You know, it, it's a lot of pressure to take on someone's wedding day. Oh, yeah. Um, so you have to be calm and collected throughout yeah. the day. Not me. Not me. I couldn't. <laughs> I don't know. Have you shot weddings in the past? I've, I've dabbled in a few, but I, I didn't enjoy them. Yeah, <laughs> it, so it was a lot me. of pressure for me. Yeah, 
yeah, I've, I've done them on requests from family. And I think that's the only time I would do it really. Um, just just being guilt tripped into it by my family for for people I know but yeah I think again hats off to people that do it um because it's 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 very highly pressured situation but you've you've basically got to kind of put a front on it even if you are panicking you're like it's like that um that analogy of the the duck in the water where on top Mm -hmm. of the surface everything looks super calm but underneath you're pedaling like hell and you're yeah that's it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just those little kind of flappy legs going forwards and backwards because yeah you're you're thinking so much right what i've got to do what's the best shot for this what's the best angle i've got the best lens you know is my battery still going how many spaces have i got left on the memory card etc so the yeah it, it's massive multitasking as we thought portraits was multitasking like you said you're going to add 10 times the amount of, of jobs on top because you've got more people to consider as yeah. well so yeah probably one of the the very more challenging aspects to to uh, photography to be a wedding photographer and um, so we'll move on to our last area uh, something a little bit different of sports photography i was i was kind of thinking about kind of action and sports i mean i've included it and called it sports as our title but you could kind of um adapt this a little bit to more like high impact action and maybe like aviation photography or or sports cars but that kind of all falls into sports anyway really so yeah um i mean i'd say in this instance again you know i've tried areas i tried parts of it for a little while working as a sports photographer i think requires eyes in the back of your head or at least you need to be so spatially aware of what's going on your, your head literally needs to be turning left and right to kind of anticipate what's coming, see what's gone in case something interesting has happened elsewhere. And because of it, you know, if it's a certain game, maybe it's like football or rugby or something, you've got to watch different areas of your scene. So you can't just have either a wide lens on and catch everything because that doesn't necessarily kind of tell the story. You know, you need to be zooming in, zooming out, moving around. So it, it's it's very physically tiring as much as it's mentally tiring like we talked about before and have you ever done any sports photography yourself I haven't no I mean I do aerial um as in the circus skill not as in aerial in the sky um <laughs> so well, like I the tv aerial <laughs> yeah not not like that kind of aerial not, not, not lying on the top of someone's roof <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, kind of gymnastics let's call it right. <laughs> um so i guess that's a sport but it's a much slower moving controlled sport so it's a lot easier to photograph um but i guess with action you know you have to physically move yourself um and again to be in those positions to get the right shot you can lie on the floor or you know be behind the goalposts and you know all these different places to get those kind of more interesting shots yeah um so I I guess you have to be really kind of uh, mobile in that sense yeah oh yeah I'd say so it's not not that you don't see you know older sports photographers but yeah you're so right if you're especially if you're being paid and and, you know you're uh, whoever's paying you you know is expecting a range of different shots and you again, you've only got a limited amount of time because it's not like a portrait session. You could, you can almost dictate maybe how long it goes on for. In this instance, the sport will tell you it will only last for twenty minutes or whatever, mm-hmm. however long it is you're shooting. You've got the game going on for. But yeah, I think knowing potentially what could happen so it's almost like a little bit of foresight you know if you can kind of like right i know the car's gone around that corner so it's going to go into this bit next etc so uh, you know you know where to position yourself but i think if you've got a good understanding of your kits like we said before um with wedding photography it's one less thing to worry about but being confident yeah. with that you can literally adapt your settings based upon the action because even with the sports even if it's like kind of formula one racing as much as they go super fast at some parts they may go a little bit slower like if they were coming into the pit lanes and then other parts they may go fast so you've got to adapt your your kit and your your settings to to work alongside that really so i think adaptability is important as well as awareness and um and being kind of confident in a way um the one other thing that i wrote down um is about kind of being competitive also um within sports photography because if you're potentially um you, you're selling those photographs say if you've, you've gone into um you know a football game or something like that and you've got like 10 or 15 other photographers nearby you the the aim is that a lot of them will be taking these photographs and sending them off to their publishers or wherever asap so they can make the front pages of a magazine or a, or a kind of an online article so you've also kind of got to be kind of keeping up a little bit 
with the other photographers that are around you more so if you're kind of taking those shots to be sold in a way because generally it's the case that the first person that gets those images to the publisher and as long as they're decent that person makes the front page so we, that's maybe kind of more towards the top end really when you're getting kind of super pro but I think an, an element of competitiveness is needed as a sports photographer but um, again um, multitasking is also quite an important thing would you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially even if you go to the younger end and go for, you know, kids football matches and food track and things like that, you're having to juggle a lot of things at once. Um, not just with kit, but with also watching the action and, and seeing what's going on, keeping track on who you photographed and who you haven't. Um, and also being spatially aware, mm. depending on the sport, you don't want to end up with a ball at the front of your camera. <laughs> Well, did you see that you know? story the other day? Um, it was in baseball um, and the fellas pitched the ball um, and it, it totally missed the, the batsman. Um, but he's, I think, it, I think it missed the batsman or he's kind of flipped it off his bat and it flew right behind him and it smashed right into the photographer's lens. Um, so like, I think it had a filter on the front of it or something like that, but it, all the, left it was so. just, yeah, it just totally smashed the front of it. And as you say, you, if you're not watching through your camera at that time and watching where that ball's gone, that could have like absolutely done a massive injury to someone. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to be kind of um, spatially aware as well. I think I'm, and obviously there's, there's other bystanders and things you don't want to go trampling over someone's picnic if they're <laughs> quietly watching the tennis or, you know. <laughs> that would be genius, just looking through the viewfinder and all you hear is squash and it's just like the, the sounds of these lovely cream jam scones being squished into the floor. <laughs> you're like, yeah, but I've got a great shot because of it. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, you, you've got to have your eyes peeled in the back of the head and, and, and kind of being aware of what's going on most definitely. But but if you're listening to this and you wanted to have a slightly kind of um, a more interactive way of finding maybe what suits your personality, we have actually, we created a, a little kind of personality test uh, a while ago on iPhotography. And again, we'll put the link in the description uh, of the video or the podcast, wherever you're, uh, you're getting this episode. So you can actually find out yourself. And there's like a series of questions that kind of lead you to a point to suggest that one area of photography may suit you a little bit better than others, but you give it a try out. I think it's been kind of, it's quite fun. I, I, I haven't actually tried it for a while. So it'd be interesting to see what it throws up. Have, have you, do you remember doing changed. it? I do yeah. remember doing it. Yeah, I have not done it for a while either, but I'm gonna have to do it. I do love little quizzes. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, it's quite interactive. This one, I think the questions are quite fun on it. So definitely, definitely check it out. But um, hopefully, again, you've enjoyed this episode and it's given you maybe a little bit more understanding as to what certain areas of photography demand from a photographer in terms of their personality, and and maybe it gives you a little bit more confidence that maybe the direction that you're going does suit you, or maybe it potentially doesn't, and you may want to kind of change tact a little little bit really but um but again if you've if you've even listened if you've enjoyed this if you've been watching this on youtube then please follow and subscribe to iPhotography. it greatly is appreciated um and we've got way more episodes coming up in the future haven't we rebecca we have yeah lots of interesting topics to, get, to cover as well indeed and uh, if, if there's if there's more things that anybody wants us to talk about or you know situations or you know discussions that you want us to have then just drop us an email you can catch us at uh, tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com um, or you can just find us on social media and just drop us a message if you've got any kind of thoughts and insights but um, if you want to check out any more of our courses and any of our products you can we've also got a dedicated link for our podcast listeners and that's learn.iPhotography.com forward slash podcast again we'll put the link in the description so you can get that really really easily but you can jump on there and you can find out more about our courses our memberships and our products anyway um but yeah again thank you very much today rebecca it's been wonderful thank again as normal <laughs> lovely and then thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you on a future episode so bye-bye for now bye